Okay, man. Well, we are back with Battleborn Doctors. We've had some technical difficulties in the last two weeks, but, uh, I mean, Rednecks will survive, huh, Brian? Well, I guess. You can call it that. So Brian almost punched me on my mouth at the beginning of the show. I, I was talking back to him. I should have. <laughs> <laughs> he, Except he, for I had such a big mouth, I would have lost my hand. <laughs> <laughs> I would have to try to find it for a week. <laughs> oh, man. I'd be spitting out teeth. Hey, so we got someone really cool on the show tonight. We've got Jason Mace, and Jason Mace is... You're the Southern Nevada DU district chairman. So you're bigger than the president of the Vegas chapter then, am I yeah. right? Well, so you're, you're, no... you're the man in Southern Nevada for Ducks Unlimited. Essentially, yeah. If somebody's got a problem, if somebody's got a concern, they can call me and I can at least figure out who to talk to. <laughs> yeah, and so... You can hang up on them just as easy as anybody else, right? 100%. <laughs> you know what you do? You know what the trick is? I'm going to tell you the trick right now if you want to hang up on somebody. You say, hello, hello, and then you push airplane mode. And then when you push airplane mode, it says car lost. <laughs> and if they're really annoying, you just block them at that point. You know, life hack. There you go. You guys all got that. <laughs> it's kind of like the emails. You have to remember that one. <laughs> the, the emails you don't want to answer that just automatically forward to the trash. Oh, they got an archive button now. Anyway, so Jason, we brought him on here to talk about ducks. Talk about what Ducks Limit does in Southern Nevada. And how long have you been with the program, Jason? So I've been working with Ducks Unlimited. Actually, um, my first DU event was 1985. My father helped volunteer for one of the duck, local Ducks Unlimited events. It was North Las Vegas back then. Um, but I got into it back then, came back, oh, about 12 years ago, I started really getting into the roots of Southern Nevada's Ducks Unlimited again. I've spent some time up in Reno playing with them. But uh, yeah, about 12 years ago. Man, that is a long time to be in conservation. Like, what, what are some stories you have? Because it's kind of a thankless job, you know? Like, you go out, you got to have one big banquet, but no one really knows that you're putting tons of hours into doing this. Well, that's, that's the thing. And, and one of the neat things about Ducks Unlimited is we tend to have a lot of volunteers that come in and help. So you get a, a, a varied number of people that come in at different points in time. So it's never always the same. It's, it's changing. It's dynamic. So... You know, there are lots of stories. There's a lot of ha people we've managed to make happy, and uh, there's been some people that weren't so pleased every so often. Yeah, and so um, one of the main reasons we brought you on the show is, you, like, a, a big way that Ducks Unlimited gets money is through their fundraising banquets. Correct. And that is a fun way to spend your money. I mean, me and my business partner, Nate, we went to one, and we walked away with a muzzle loader, and we were happy as pie. Shooting ducks with a muzzle or it seems wrong, just wrong. So it seems very democratic, doesn't they, it? They do actually make shotgun setups for muzzle loaders. So, they, so. they do. They do. Yeah, I got one of my Crocs when I shoot one. Uh, only if you're shooting them with your rainbow flag attached. So. <laughs> Anyways, so tell us a little bit about the banquet. How does it run? What do people need to know about it? So the Why do you do it? Yeah. Well, the soonest banquet that we've got coming up is going to be on June 12th at Samstown. It's the Henderson Annual Banquet. Um we didn't have one last year, unfortunately, because of the COVID. It hit us pretty hard. Uh, but we're hoping to come back this year rolling strong and, and, and do pretty well. Doors will open at about 5 5.30-ish, um, as it stands right now. Uh, we're hoping to have at least 150 people through the door. Uh, standard ticket prices are $85 a piece, $150 for a couple. We're selling tables of six for $600. Now, do the tables of six for 600 do they get put into a gun raffle? Correct. Correct. For every five tables we sell, we, we've got a specific gun raffle where one of those ta tables will win a gun and they get to pull it off of something called the Great Gun Giveaway Banner. Oh, and I what that is, is you get your choice. Instead of us having a Winchester SXP mm -hmm. or, or, or a specific gun that your, the tables actually win, they can look. There's choices from rifles and shotguns. And if you want a Taurus judge, there's a Taurus judge on there. You know, there's a pile of different guns that you can actually choose from. So it, it it's a little nicer because you can actually get the people what they want, not necessarily, well, that's the 18th six and a half creed more I can throw in my uh, gun safe. Yeah, no, I, I love that because you walk up to this wall and it's like a 10 by 10 banner almost, right? Correct. And on that 10 by 10 banner, they have like 50 guns up there. And then, then you just point out which one you want. You're like, yep. that's the gun I want. And so it's almost like if you win that raffle, you get to go shopping. Mm -hmm. You know, you get to pick out the gun. Haven't you been trying to win one for years? I have never won a gun off the Great Gun Giveaway. But it's, it's I have. And I, I've been itching for a Ruger. 
there is a Ruger Black Hawk and 45 Long Colt on that poster. And I've wanted it for years, and I've never managed to get it. Yeah. Now, you do a few other fun games. I know my kids love them when they're there. They have, um, last year you had duck calls. You could buy duck calls, and then every duck call you bought, you got put into a raffle. Correct, correct. On that one, we actually had a mystery safe raffle. And what we did was we actually took a safe that was donated by Sportsman's Warehouse, and we put a gun in it, closed it up, and then we auctioned off, or excuse me, we raffled off, uh, I believe it was 50 duck calls. And then when you, if we pulled your number on that one, if you had the, the winning ticket, walk up, open the safe, figure out what's inside it. You walk away with a gun and the safe. Yeah. So it's a pretty good. Did I tell you what happened at one banquet, Brian? I looked like a dummy. So I went to this well, banquet. Well, that's every banquet. So hey, you got to have to narrow it down a little <laughs> bit Brian more. Brian makes fun of me because I win a lot of guns and he don't win a lot of guns. So anyways, <laughs> anyways, I go to this banquet. It was up in Meadow Valley. Have you been to that one? Yeah. Up in Cal- it's a, that's a, in Caliente. That is yep. a killer banquet. They have Absolutely. big old ribeye steaks. It's a fun time, you know. And I, it was a gun safe, and I thought they ran it like Duck Saloon. You know, you get the safe and the gun. Mm-hmm. And so I bought my cards, and then they pull my number, and I win. Nice. And they're like, okay, what do you want, the gun or the safe? And I was like, both. Yeah, why not both? And they're like, no. No, you get to you get choose one, the gun or the safe. And I was like, okay, find the safe. But <laughs> you, get, you guys messed me up on that one. It wasn't a little crowd either. I was acting dumb in front of. So you would have enjoyed it, Brian. Oh, yeah, I would have. I would have. I would have made sure you remembered yeah. it too. I probably would have videoed it. Anyway, so with these, you, you like they they run a few. How many how many banquets do they run in Nevada? So we've got eleven chapters currently in Nevada, and, and I think it's about you know, say twenty twenty four ish banquets that they actually have, um, or excuse me, events. Now we can have normal banquets, which we'll have eleven of them, just like the number of, of mm-hmm. chapters in the states. And they also do golf outings or clay pigeon shoots, or we, we sell the calendars, the gun calendars as oh. well. Yes, tell tell us about those real quick. But then I want to get back to your banquets. But tell so us about the gun calendars. The gun so calendars are, are you buy a calendar from Ducks Unlimited, and with that calendar comes a raffle ticket. Now that raffle ticket puts you in for. 52 individual raffles, one gun a week for the entire year. So your one ticket, if you're much luckier than I am, could actually win you 25 guns. Um, there are a couple people that have managed to win two guns in one month off the same ticket. But, yeah, we, we should start selling those probably late June. Um, we limited it last year. We actually sold out of calendars for the first time. Uh, at 1,500 calendars. So we might make a couple more calendars this year, but uh, we'll see how that goes. Really? Yeah, I love that because every week you look forward to the email yep. seeing whether or not you won or not that gun. Just to see that you're a loser for yet another week. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> Some of us, huh? Now, um, yeah, and with those banquets, so you have 11 here in Nevada. Mm-hmm. Every banquet generates anywhere between twenty to about $40,000. Generally, yeah. yeah. Some of the big ones actually get up over two hundred thousand dollars. It's pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah. Some of the big ones, but does that happen in Nevada? Well, I guess it might happen up by the Fallon area. What's the biggest banquet they so have? So the Reno and Sparks banquets. The Reno banquet back in the back in the mid nineties, the Reno banquet had five hundred people at it. Um, hopefully, this year we'll have three or four hundred people at the Reno banquet and it should it should do real well the other one that does very very well is Elko Elko does very well for all that stuff the NRA banquets I mean they're they're the top performer for those ones it's the uh the mining companies up there so correct the money correct. that comes out of those mining companies is just incredible and they do very well they're always the top performer club for just about any banquet so and this is what I love about Ducks Limited so you're making this money you know and everybody goes well where does the money go um, it might not all stay in Nevada, but ducks migrate. So if you're Correct. donating to Ducks Unlimited and you love duck hunting, no matter what, that money is going to go to help duck habitat. It's going to go help nesting. It's going to go help to, you know, um, to to keep those ducks alive. So a lot of people might say, well, like with the Mule Deer <laughs> Foundation, um, not to talk bad about them. I love Mule Deer. I love what they do. But some of that money doesn't stay in Nevada, and the Mule Deer don't come to nevada you know so you have to go out and say to hunt but with yeah. ducks luckily ducks fly and so if you if you donate to ducks unlimited and if you go to these banquets the ducks are it, your 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 hunting is going to improve because mm-hmm. they're always doing stuff how many they, they spend millions on conservation correct 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 yeah and in, in fact we've spent total money spent in the state of nevada is about 15 million 
just in the state of Nevada. I mean, we're the driest state in the United States. And we don't have a huge volume of areas for ducks to roost because it's just the way we are, mm -hmm. right? But in spite of that, we've still saved, uh, we've got about 75,000 acres that we've helped conserve here in, the law, in, in Nevada. And we put about 15 million into that project, those projects. You were telling me before we started the podcast, some of the projects you've done in Southern Nevada. Just tell us a little bit about those. So we've got, um, we've just about every single water, ma waterfowl management area in Southern Nevada, you know, Key Pittman, Overton, um, Paranagate. Uh, we ha we've had projects there at, at each of those places. Um, throughout the years. I mean, keep it, we just did a bunch of seeding uh, a couple years ago. Overton, we went out and modified one of the ponds and made it more productive and more beneficial for the ducks. Uh, ducks Unlimited actually had a, a, an agreement with the Southern Nevada Water Authority where we helped build some of the uh, um, grade control weirs out in the Las Vegas wash, which incur does a significant benefit by... Um, Creating additional marsh marsh areas for the for the birds. Okay, so it makes bull rush areas to where they Correct. can go in. That wash is, I mean, the the transformation and you know, the transformation that wash has made since they started doing those weir projects is just incredible. It went from basically an unusable product. It to, was a homeless to, camp, right? Well, yeah. it still is to a certain extent, <laughs> but um, they've they've turned it into a true world class marsh area out there. I mean the, the animals, the beavers and the cranes and the ducks and the geese that are all out there. I mean, people would be amazed that that's in southern Nevada because you would think and it's all essentially is it's runoff and wastewater, right? So the, the water gets treated, it goes through that system and before it was just the channels were bad, everything was bad, it couldn't sustain any habitat. And now with those control structures, we have that habitat that we haven't had for a long time. Unfortunately, we can't hunt that habitat, but, you know, it would be nice to hunt it because that's a great habitat to hunt. But Oh, yeah. Yeah, we went from, I mean, if you if you had gone out there before, say, late 90s, you were running into mostly salt cedars, right? Um, and, and that stream that went, the Las Vegas Wash, went from an ephemeral stream to one that was running hundreds of millions of gallons every single year down into the lake. So it started cutting itself down and basically it was eroding continually. So they, along with Ducks Unlimited, SNWA put in the grade control structures out there, a lot of dump rock structures, some concrete gabion structures. There's, there's a bunch of different types, but each one of those little st structures works like a dam and it builds up a backwater behind it that was able to convert gnarly, nasty salt cedar area to beautiful marshes with cattails and um, bulrush and, 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 and basically created a lot more habit, habitat for the, the all sorts of water, waterfowl. And those marsh are really important too because that's where ducks go and nest and that's where you get your chicks. And, you know, and like Brian said, yeah, I wish I could hunt that. But after being uh, talking to a lot of biologists and being in the conservation for a world for a little bit, it's important that ducks have somewhere to lay down and rest, and they will mm -hmm. move on eventually, except for the mallards. The mallards don't move if there's food. Yeah, yeah but, they're fat. <laughs> they're fat old mallards. But for the <laughs> most part, those ducks will move. They'll move. And so if you give them somewhere to rest for a little bit, then you know the next guy has more of an opportunity to get Well, them. the other thing is uh, ducks and, uh, are just like any other animal. Once they outgrow that habitat, they're going to spread out. So we've seen it with uh, Endow brought some of the geese down in to southern Nevada from up north. Mm -hmm. And they brought them into the Overton area. And that, pop, that goose population got so robust that they outgrew the area. And so they started moving. So now you can go to any golf course in southern Nevada, and there's geese all over it. And all of those geese just about came from the Overton area. And huh. so they start, they start moving out because they don't have a habitat to support yeah. anymore. anymore. So th that, those structures and stuff like that out of that wash is the same thing with ducks. Once those ducks develop and outgrow that area they're going to, have to find somewhere to move and yep. so they're going to go to the next closest body of water well eventually that next closest body of water is going to be overton key Pittman, mm -hmm. piranha again that that's just a natural thing so if we can support these projects even if we can't hunt them it, in the long term it's going to do us a it benefits load us. Yep. of help so yeah that's that's something that i i don't think a lot of people understand about duck hunters from the non-consumptive user you know that 
like people like Jason, you're a you're a huge duck hunter. I mean, I've ran into you several times up duck hunting. Absolutely. And the more you get into duck hunting, the more you're like, listen, I got to make sure I'm giving back mm-hmm. because there's no one that loves ducks more than a duck hunter. I think. Like you love everything about them. I mean, I'll go deer hunting and I'll stop looking for deer and start looking at ducks. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know if you ever do that. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about your uh, your your hunting history in Southern Nevada? How it started? Your you know, how you got into it. So my, my, my I started out hunting Key Pittman in, I think, 82 or 83. Who was the first one that brought you out? That was my father. My really? father. My, my dad grew up in Wisconsin shooting uh, Hurricane Marsh, um, Lake Poygan. Um, they were just devout duck hunters. His, his father was a duck hunter. His grandfather was a duck hunter. Um, I grew up with my dad shooting his grandfather's Auto 5, right? Really? Classic. Beautiful old gun, barrel, floating barrel. It's just, it's, it's the, it's the duck hunting shotgun to me, just because that's okay. what I grew up with. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, by the time I was old enough, um, my dad got me a shotgun, and we went out and did opening day at Key Pittman, and I was hooked. Um, it took me a whole box of shells before I managed to knock a single bird down. And, Are you serious? Oh yeah, oh yeah, twenty. But luckily. Back then, it was lead, and it was a lot less expensive to shoot. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, green wing teal. Drake green wing teal was the first bird I ever knocked out of the sky, and I'm tickled pink to this day about it. Really? Yeah. There's something to be said about love and teal. <clears throat> so so it, it was your dad that got you started on this whole endeavor. How many people have you brought out since you started hunting? I can't even put a number on that. One of the things I like to do is get buddies of mine, take them out to Overton. I, I love Overton for teaching people how to duck hunt because you're in a, um, you're in a specific area. I prefer hunting at Key Pittman personally, just because yeah. I've spent a lot more time up there. But at Overton, you go out, you, you've got a specific hunting blind you're in. Um, one of the most important things that I, I try to instill in people is, is knowing what to shoot and what really not to shoot. So anytime I get somebody out there, I need to make sure that they're not going to shoot the grebe that just sw- swam into the decoys. <laughs> The pelican that just, sw- you know. You mean the snow goose? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, a, that's, it's that's, a snow goose. It's just got a different beak. Yeah, a really long beak. <laughs> that, that's funny you say that about Overton because that's similar with me and Brian. When we go out to Overton, that's our starter area mm-hmm. too. Like anybody knew, it's such a controlled environment and it's such a, um, it's such a country club environment to where yep. they, they're able to go sit in a nice wooden blind. And, you know, when they're done, they're done. They can walk back to the truck and get McDonald's. Mm-hmm. You know, you go home and sleep. And so Overton is a great starter area. And they, 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 there's no, like, guessing where I should be. There's only one place you can be. If you're not yep. in that place, you're going to get a fine. Well, right. we, don't, we know that's not true because we had somebody that just showed up and took a blind one day, remember? Well, old green jeans didn't catch him. <laughs> you got caught by old green jeans. He, you're you're going to get a ticket, you yeah. know? <laughs> so, and, and they sneak up on you, as, as, as we found out last season. Well, the difficult part about Overton is just the sheer number of guys that are out there that aren't doing it the right way. So it's a, Correct. It's a difficult place to hunt. I mean, it's certainly probably the most difficult place in Southern Nevada to hunt, um, besides being out at the wetlands, because mm-hmm. then you've got to always be watching for a park ranger. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but no, that, so it's just... Uh, I say if you can hunt Overton, you can pull limit out of Overton. You're really doing something. Mm-hmm. Because or you're really lucky. Well, it's one of the two. Yeah, you're gonna ha- you're gonna be fighting off other hunters and people that are sky busting and chasing birds off and just not doing it the right way. So it can be a little bit frustrating for for new hunters a little bit too, just Correct. because you have that issue. But man, you're generally gonna get a shoot at a couple birds. Mm-hmm. Um, if you go early season, you can usually do pretty good if you kind of know where to be a little bit. Yep. Um, it, it is great because you get in there, there's somewhere to sit. You're not sitting in the water. You're not sitting trying to brush up. You, I mean, you can hunt effectively out there. I mean, we've walked up on guys with no decoy set hunting out there, and they got birds, mm-hmm. you know. And the other, the other good thing is as big of a pain in the butt of, of the overcrowding is it also pushes birds. So I watched a guy hunt over no decoys, and every time I'd shoot at birds – I drop a bird and it push a, push the rest of the birds towards them and right they drop a bird. Yeah. So um, it, it can be kind of a good thing too, I guess. It's just, especially once you get a little more experience, it's a frust- that's a frustrating hunt for sure. Well, it's a frustrating hunt if you're experienced. 
Correct. If you're used to seeing, if you're used to limiting out in 45 minutes because there's birds everywhere, that's one story. If you're, if you've never been hunting before and every 15 minutes you're all excited because yeah. you can see some birds in the, in the, in the distance. And I don't generally let them blow calls because I'm not very good at blowing calls either. But <laughs> yeah, um, but sometimes no call is better than a correct. good call at over yeah. time. Yeah, especially late season. You know, light decoys, no call, mm -hmm. no motion. You know, it, it, you got to adjust because they, they're just shot out. You know, yeah. by the end of the season, there's they've seen it all. And they're just like, hey, I don't need none of that. I'm going, going somewhere else. One so. of my favorite areas to hunt in Overton is the actual dike that Ducks Unlimited fixed. Yep. It was, it's that, that for this pond down there in Pintel Wilson and that back dike down there, I, I guess it used to be a muddy mess. And uh, I guess the flood blew it out. And Ducks Unlimited spent around, it was either between twenty or $50,000 to rebuild up that dike and put it in. And, like, nobody knows about it. And I wish I wish people, like, I, I've talked to people about Ducks Unlimited. I said, hey, you ought to get involved in Ducks Unlimited. You ought to help with these other conservation groups. And they say... Well, I haven't heard anything Ducks Limit did. And I'm like, well, it's, they don't really talk about it, but do you like this dike you're walking on? That was Ducks Limited. Well, and that's the thing is, uh, Ron and I with wind, so they, you go out to Paranagat, and there's a dike of Paranagat that's mm -hmm. called the Wind Dike. Yeah. It's called the Wind Dike for a reason because wind built the dike. Ducks Unlimited just doesn't do a very good job sometimes of putting their sign up and saying, <laughs> hey. Yeah, man, here. you got you got to stop being so humble. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, we're trying. We're trying. We've actually got some new signage that we uh, just recently put up near Stillwater uh, on some projects that we're doing out there or that we had, had, had done out there. Um, so we're trying to get the, get the word out, make sure that people realize that in spite of Vegas being such a dry or Nevada being such a dry state, we still do some, st well, do some work out here. I think it's important, too, from a perspective of trying to... to get recruitment and trying to raise money. Correct. If guys think that there's no money coming back into the state, they're obviously not going to support absolutely the, the cause. And so if we can get those projects out in the forefront to where, Hey, you know, we did this and this is what we did this year. Mm -hmm. I think it's, that's one of the toughest things. I know we, Ron and I run into that issue with win all the time is we go out and do stuff and we're horrible about taking pictures. Right. Yeah, so it's, I'm good at using a shovel. Yeah. You, you get out there and do the work, but there's no evidence that you did the work. And so you go to mm -hmm. your banquet and normally that's a great time. You throw a slideshow up and hey, this is all the stuff we did for the year. And then you got three pictures. Right. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't necessarily tell you what they did. Right. right. Correct. There, there was 20, 30 projects, but we have three pictures. So, yeah. and I think it's a big part of the national office too, because they want, Obviously, the national office wants a big, sexy project, right? Oh, mm -hmm. we saved 100,000 acres over in Florida and the Everglades, right? Yeah. We're not going to necessarily get that, but when we can get that stuff and make people aware, hey, we did this dike over here or we did this rehab project over here, you know, those are those little projects are going to go a long ways because we, we're limited on habitat in the state of Nevada. Up mm -hmm. north is, is certainly... We don't a, have water habitat down here? Yeah. So up north <laughs> is certainly... The water district guys still in the A lot more <laughs> blessed than we are down in the south. I mean, they've got some natural habitat up there. Correct. It stays cool enough to where they can maintain that habitat. Well, they're a natural flyway, too. Yeah, and Vegas, it's not even the fact that we not being in the flyway. It's just, it gets so hot in the summer yeah. that nothing's going to stay. And then all those those areas that could hold a little bit of water are going to dry. Yeah. You know, and you get stuff like, I will tell you for a fact, that Big Bend out in, uh, out in Laughlin, the treatment water treatment plant out there, during duck season, they get three, four hundred ducks at a time coming in and set up some oh, yeah. their ponds. Are you yeah. keeping this a secret to yourself, man? Not inviting me, huh? Yeah, nope, nope. <laughs> I, 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 I can thought get we access. were friends, man. But no, so you get those. If there's an opportunity, they'll be there. And now they're uh -huh. not. They're not going to set on that river just because of the flow of that river so fast that there's no way to set. And there's really no calm areas in that. That so they need to find a nice calm pond, and that's mm -hmm. a perfect spot for them. So. As we can create these even little projects, you know, if we can create more habitat in some of the parks and stuff like that, those things will grow and they'll start to hold ducks over time. So, oh, yeah. have you watched the the how Ducks Limit is started? I watched a video on YouTube to prep for this tonight. Have you seen that one? No. I, I liked it because they start off with John Wayne talking, and I don't remember. We what know he you said. and John Wayne. <laughs> I don't remember what he said, but it sounded cool. And then always does. It always does. <laughs> I mean, he was a mean drunk, 
but he, he was very he, he he made he made everything look cool no matter mm-hmm. what he said. Anyways, he can make Brian look cool. Anyway, so that's it, not hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> okay, and then he go. They go on to talk about how ducks limited started. It was back in 1936 after the Great Depression. There are no ducks. Like guys were going out and they're catching like two ducks a day, and guys started getting really frustrated. And so it was a bunch of guys that got together and said, "Hey, we got to change this." And that's how ducks limited started. And it was just like a few guys like us in a room mm-hmm. saying, "I love duck hunting, and I don't want to lose this sport for my kids." Yep. And you know they go out and start doing projects, and it, it's still that grassroots effort today. Where it's just guys like Jason that he's out, and he's like, "Hey, man, I really, I really enjoy ducks. Mm-hmm. I really love ducks." And like, there's three ways you could help. Either you could put your money where your mouth is, you put your labor where your mouth is, or you can, you know, do both. <laughs> you know, yep. And and if you're doing both, that's great. But if you if you don't have the the strength to go out and throw a shovel anymore. These banquets are a great place to go do that. And yeah, 100%. You know, I think they're, a, I think they're a great time. Oh well, yeah. I haven't been to a banquet that we haven't had a good time at, you know, they're just, you get there, you're around like-minded people. Yeah. Um, there's the auctions and then there's raffles and there's all this stuff going on. And, and you know, it, it is, it's just a good time to get out. And, and so you're going to spend 85 bucks on a ticket or 150 bucks for a couple, but you're going to spend that going out to dinner for the night and watching a movie. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you're going to have two hours at a movie and, and dinner for an hour, your three hours or your four hours, but that money is going to keep giving back, right? Especially if you're a hunter, it's going to keep giving back to something that you enjoy doing. So for me, it's that's kind of a no-brainer. Yeah, we think about, oh, $150, that's a lot of money, but you think about what you'd spend doing anything. Yeah, it's hard enough even going out with a family husband, wife, two kids. If you go out to a dinner somewhere, you're at a hundred bucks right there. Very, very, very well, I went to I went to a rodeo. We had free tickets to the PBR finals one year. And, and uh, by the time we were done, I was $300 into yeah. a free ticket, you know, and that's mm-hmm. with a wife and, and two kids. But you got these, these things and not only are you going to have a good dinner, you're going to have, you know, have a couple beers, whatever, mm-hmm. do the auction and stuff. But you're going to meet like-minded people, and there's relationships built there, and and you never know when that's going to lead to maybe I found a new hunting spot or or something like that. A new so, hunting buddy, a yeah, new hunting buddies, and that's such an important thing. We got to kind of, as we talked about it the other night, about getting groups together and everybody working together instead mm-hmm. of working against each other. I know we do with our bank. We do a lot of trading. Hey, we'll give you a table. You give us a table. We'll come support you. You come support us. And, and so you do these things and. And then when we need a project to get done or we're right now, the state of Nevada is at a critical, critical drought level, right? So Correct. We're hurting. We're hurting for water. And I'll tell you, I was in Laughlin today. It was 107 degrees in Laughlin already. So it's not going to get any better this, yeah. this year. So we're going to have a hot summer. We're going to wish ha- we were kind of like ducks where you just can migrate. Be like, no, but we're going like to have to do some here. really <laughs> creative things in, in the near future. I was talking to somebody today about getting some trailers to Fill, start filling some waters and stuff. Get those guzzlers taken care of. But, but we're going to have to do some creative things, not only for the big game, but for our waterfowl too, because they're going to start, some of the smaller ponds and stuff are going to go away. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you think about Piranigat, the lower pond at Piranigat where most people hunt, that is a very shallow pond. You can walk across the entire thing. And if you've looked at it over the years, you've seen that it's been dry a bunch over the years. Well, it's dry compared to when I was a kid, because it used to go all the way on the other side of the highway and fill in that little bowl over there. Oh, yeah. So that bowl used to always be full, too. And so, yeah, it's crazy. We went up to, we were up at Sunnyside quite a bit this year, and Sunnyside was so low, you couldn't get to boat most places. Oh, geez. You know, we were, we're running a mud motor that's only, we can draft in a couple inches of water. A couple inches, wow. And, and we were out pushing the boat half of the time. So it, it's... It, it no took fun. a toll, and, no. and and we had the wildfires, and so with mm-hmm. the drought comes the wildfires. Well, the first source of water is going to be our duck habitat. You know, unfortunately, that's that's the closest source. <clears throat> Frenchie got nailed this year. Yeah, Frenchie got smashed. Frenchie. We saw you up there before opening yep. day. Yeah. <laughs> Frenchie was empty, so before Correct. opening day, they started filling it the day before. Mm-hmm. And, and so, but yeah, it's a. And it, he had to beg and borrow that water. Our our guy up there, Andrew. Andrew. Andrew that runs that WMA up there, mm-hmm. he went to all the farmers and said, hey, listen, I've got a big duck hunt coming up tomorrow. Can you please, please, please let me have some of your water? 
And that kid does such a he, – he does a great job up there, man. He works hard. He's got – the cool thing is Ron and I will go up and talk to him about, hey, what do you need? And he's got a list of projects that he wants to get done, and every one of them is to improve that habitat. It's not a, hey, I want you to build a fence around my house. No, it's a, yeah. hey, we need to pull down some of the some of the reeds coming in here. and Some of the cattails need to be pulled out. Hey, I'd like to plant this field. We're talking about he wants to laser level his field so he doesn't mm-hmm. lose so much water. So he can better manage the water that he has. The deer and the goose and all that population. Yeah. You know, and that's, we, we get that from Robert Pranigat too. He does, he's done an, an excellent job with that management area over there. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's so much better than what it used to be with the limited water that he has, but he holds the water well. He moves the water well. Um, the well we're duck- so lucky to have him. He came back from the back south. You know, where it's a big duck area, and he yeah. understands ducks and water management. Well, and, he's and, he's a devout duck lover. I it, mean, that, that man is. I know some people have problems with him, but I can't like I can't complain about him because he works his butt off. Well, mm-hmm. and, and we have, I mean, love him or hate him. I mean, these WMA managers have a tough job. Yeah. So they're they're not only and what people <laughs> what people fail to understand is they're not just running the habitat for ducks; they're running it for everything right and so there's predator control they have to do there's weed control that they're mandated by the state to do there's all these other functions Mm -hmm. and most of them are avid hunters as well so they want to come out and enjoy the hunting in the areas and we're good friends with brady up in up in uh sunny side and you know benny everybody knows benny if they're you're hunting overton benny's you know done a pretty good job out there i mean we can always do more, but it's up to the sportsmen. We had a conversation one day with some sportsmen that were complaining about WMAs. And then we're like, well, have you gone out and asked if you could help do a project? And I, well, can we just go pick up trash? And we're like, yeah, nobody's stopping you. Oh, guaranteed. Like that. And, and, and so there's projects we can do. We just go talk to the WMA manager and say, hey, mm-hmm. this is my idea. What do you think? And if a WA manager buys off on it, you just go out and do the project. If you're going to pay for it. Mm-hmm. They're going to let you do the work. Yeah. You know, we put, um, there's brand new goose boxes up at, up at Key Pittman. Key Pittman. And we were expecting a two year mm-hmm. return before return they, started, before they using started using those goose boxes. Half of the goose boxes are in use already. And so we did it right at the beginning of duck season. We stuffed them a couple months ago. We and the them. average uh, hatch rate on a du- or goose is around like uh, between six and 10. And so if half are being used and we put 12 out, that's probably close to 60 new geese coming out. So That's wonderful. And you're getting stuff like that, but it's they're not going to stop you from doing a project if, no. it's, if it works, right? So you're not, you're not going to be able to come in there and say, oh, yeah, I'm going to do this project and just put a blind up in the middle of, of a field, right? And they're not, they're going to they're tell you no, but if it's a project that makes sense mm-hmm. and it's a project that works to, A, increase the habitat, and, B, that's going to be usable for everybody – Chances are they're gonna they're gonna welcome you with open arms and yeah, huh? so some of it doesn't even cost you anything. I, I can tell you that if you went to went to uh, Overton at the beginning of when the millet starts to grow out and it starts to seed, mm-hmm. you got to Overton. Benny would love you to go out and pick millet and give it to him so he can replant it somewhere else. Hmm. You, you know, and that's a free project. It's yeah. not a fun project, but it's a very useful. Why is it project. not fun, Bray? Because that millet gets, man, it's fiberglass is what it is. And it goes through your gloves and it goes through oh your boy. second like pair of gloves. Like and... leather cow gloves. Wow. It just goes right through it. But we need to, we need that feed, that food source. We need that feed. So if we can transition that into other bull rushes that don't have any, then we increase our chances of holding ducks. So, yeah. so it's all these little things that we can do. If you go out there and go out for a weekend, take a scout troop out and just clean up. Get all the shells cleaned up. You know, that's a big, huge thing because mm-hmm. uh, some of these hunters that come out and use some of these facilities on the weekends are, are horrible. Yeah. I mean, they don't take care of their stuff. You own it. Why are you going to trash something that you well, own? Well, that's my that's my house and that's your house. And, like, if you have a bad roommate, you kick him out. But, unfortunately, we can't kick him out. Well, yeah. and it's, it, it really is the point where I picked up a case or two of shells one day, but I followed Ron had done it the week before in the same exact line. And, wow! And, and so you're you know, thinking at 25. No, he's saying 250. Yeah, two 250 rounds a piece that we picked Holy up in, in a week. He, he, he did it, and I did it about a week later. A week later, and, and people are just—they don't care, and, and they don't take care of things. And, and we've noticed it more and more. I've I've gone up to Mount Charleston, not at the lake. I mean, everything's trash. Uh, I mean, pick up after yourselves. You know, 
make it a good environment. If if it's trash, guess what? You're going to just chase the ducks out, and they're never going to come back. But I think yeah. it comes down the same way with Jason's uh, Ducks Limited Club. Is like I bet you have a lot of people show up saying, "Hey, I'm willing to help," but then when it comes time to do the work, everybody's gone. Well, that that that's always going to be the case, right? There's always going to be somebody that says. Yes, I want to do this. Yes, I want to do this. Yes, I want to do this. And it happens across the board. I mean, the very first time I ever had an elk tag, I had 10 people that were going to come out and help me track down that elk, get my bull elk. It's going to be great. Mm -hmm. How many people actually showed up? Me. (laughs) See, Ron and I are like that. Ron, you got an elk tag? All right, we're coming. (laughs) If it's during duck season, man. Yeah, if it's during duck season, it's a little bit tougher (laughs) for us, but... It's just, and, and Ron and I have, you know, we will hunt anything, but I mean, really, if there's ducks to be hunted, we want to hunt ducks. And we'd go up every year for um, Friends of NRA. They do do their grant meeting mm-hmm. and it's, it changes, but it was in Elko and Reno and it kind of flip flop back and forth. And we go up there and it's right at the end of duck hunting season. So we'd go up on a Friday, hunt Friday on the way up there and go to the meeting on Saturday and come home. It, it, but people, we have a lot of fair weather hunters, but there's nothing wrong with it. Mm-hmm. Um, you got a lot of people that are, and people are upset. Oh, you're getting too many people into the sport. Well, a lot of these guys are going to hunt maybe one or two weekends out of a season. You know, they're going to do it. They're going to do it once or twice a season, and, yeah. and they're going to be done. I just call it my recruitment program, man, because there's a lot of fair weather hunters that show up. And but if you bring somebody out to hunt with you, all of a sudden they turn to someone that's helping you out with projects in the office. Correct. Right? And and you know, a lot of those fair weather hunters, um, they're still going to. They're going to enjoy themselves. you got to get people out there. And we're losing sportsmen. I mean, in this country, every single year, we have fewer and fewer and fewer hunters. And like you brought up earlier, hunters are the greatest conser- conservationists that there are. They love being out there. One of my favorite things about duck hunting, I can have a, a solid day where I don't even pull the trigger. But if I got to see that sun rise up over the marsh... And I got to sit there, listen to some birds, try to call some ducks in. Yeah. I don't care. It's beautiful. I get to go out and do it with my children as well. And that's just, that right there makes me happy as a clam. Well, the other thing that people don't realize is that pretty much every division of wildlife, Department of Wildlife, however you want to look at it, between every state, mm-hmm. is pretty much solely funded by the hunting community. So the yes. sportsmen, those license fees, um, every time we buy a, buy a gun, every time we buy ammo, that tax that goes is going to go right back into that conservation fund and yep. those hunting funds. And so we're, we, we joke about it. You know, this, everybody hates the sky buster. Everybody mm-hmm. hates an Overton sky buster. It's going to go through a case and get two ducks. Right. But we laugh and we call them. Those are the best conservationists in the world because they're spending a lot of tax money <laughs> for two ducks. Right. Uh-huh. So, so they, they, they done paid for their two ducks, you know, just in tax revenue. So, mm-hmm. If if we get, and they enjoy doing it, they didn't even feel bad. Yeah, if we get every more single time I have there. to pay the IRS, I get pissed off. Every time I shoot a bullet, I'm not mad. <laughs> and if we get more people, even just buying the duck stamps, going out and buying a license, and the funny thing with the duck stamps is a lot of the duck stamps aren't even sold to duck hunters. Correct. So Correct. a lot of the duck stamps are actually people that collect the duck stamps. So, and then you have your hunters, and then you have your hunters that are they want to buy one and they need to put on the back of their license so they can hunt. Mm-hmm. But then they want to buy one so they have one, right? So yep. they, they're going to buy that one to display as well. And so that revenue source is huge, and it goes huge to the duck habitat for that one. So I, there's a lot of sources that are solely the hunter that's bringing that income in. And then you got these conservation groups, you know, Sierra Club and this and that. Well, they open their mouth a lot, mm-hmm. but they don't open their wallets a lot. They open when they want to yeah. sue the horses. It's usually, usually lawyers are the only ones that win when the Sierra Club is in, involved. Hey, but. So let me ask you, as a club, as a Ducks Unlimited Club chapter in Southern Nevada, what do you guys need? Like, what's your cry for help? What do you guys need to make your guys' group more successful? The biggest thing we can use is volunteers and for generally people just to show up to the dinners. That's the biggest thing that we need. We can always use more help setting the dinners up, set, selling calendars, you know, general fundraising items and it, it's kind of neat because it's not a full-time job by any means it's not a huge workload if you many hands make for light work right yeah the more people you have the more dispersed it is you do something over a weekend or a wednesday night you make a call or two you know that all helps the more people th- that are willing to help us the easier it is for everybody and the more money we can make for ducks yeah, and then you, you get around like-minded people, too, and, it's, and it makes it an enjoyable time. But correct. I think you're absolutely correct. It's almost like you don't need 
a ton of money under Ducks Unlimited. <laughs> what you need is you need the manpower because I, I've seen you've done this for 12 years. And I'm sure the reason you've done it for 12 years is you're afraid if you walk away, <clears throat> it's going to disappear. That's 100 percent true. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I, I can't leave it. I won't. I'm going to make sure that Ducks in Southern Nevada is going to be as successful as it possibly can. Well, there's a lot of, not just the banquet, there's other events that go on. I mean, we we sat down with you last week, Wednesday, and mm-hmm. did, a, did a happy hour. Yeah. You know, and guys get together. We talk about talked about hunting and stuff like that, talked about what we can do to help conserve. There's the Continental Street that you guys do every year. Yep. You know, those fundraisers are, are huge to being able to, to give back. And even if part of it's going out of state and some of it's staying here, the money that's staying here, we're putting to good use. So. Mm-hmm. If you can get that, and then if you can take that same money and we get a couple clubs that maybe we only have ten thousand dollars, you know, that we can spend. But if I got five clubs with ten thousand dollars. That's fifty grand. Yep, I can do a lot of good with fifty grand, you know. And and th- there are projects, and there's a lot of the heritage fund projects are matching funds. They want to see some matching funds, so you got to put some skin in the game. Yeah, we yep. can come up with great ideas, but if we don't have any money to give back, and where where we really struggle a lot of times is. We can have a little bit of money to do a project, but if mm-hmm. I don't have anybody to do the project, yeah. that's that's tough. And we we've run into that for for quite a while with the wind group. Is we had some we had a great turnout on the last one. John showed up. Who else showed up? John, jo- Joseph, Terry, Scott, um, obviously. Your your other the one buddy that you had the, there. A lot of guys from the retriever club. We had like fifteen guys show up to install nice. wooden duck boxes. That's wonderful. That, that's outstanding. I mean, like you have probably what like three loyal members in the club that are always there. Yeah, three or four, three or four, yeah. and that's about that's well, that's our core down here. And that's Ron. So Ron, and I this was a, this project was pretty funny because we did have a lot, and it was one of the smaller projects we've done. Mm-hmm. But it, well, sometimes it's just Ron and I, you know, yeah. out there, or it's Ron and I, our kids. I mean, and and so you get out there, and, and we we're going to do the work regardless. But yeah. if we had a lot of people doing the work, it, it sure makes life a whole lot easier. We get a lot more done. Like you said, many hands make light but work. But we we Correct. did in a couple hours. How many wood duck boxes did we set? Like 12. Yeah, like 12 wood duck boxes along the river. Well, if those wood duck boxes get used and we can produce some more wood ducks, it, it just strengthens that In species. the Alamo area, you know. And we've got, I mean, we've yep. got, there's some in Overton. Mm-hmm. My, my first duck I ever took was, was a wood duck was out of really? Overton. It's mind-blowing, isn't it? So Henner Drake. It was it was a juvie Drake, I think, if I remember okay. right. But That's still cool. Th- then my kid got That's one awesome. that same season, but it was a fully plumed beautiful drake so gorgeous ron got a the same day that i got mine ron got a hen and then i think ron got another one and we had four out of the dozen that came out of overton that year and, and <laughs> we're so just the, in the right spot the, man. yeah <laughs> there are um some wood ducks in overton still mm-hmm. they they brought some down they didn't thrive like they'd hoped they would but they're still nesting so if we give them again another environment to where they can thrive in then we have we can bring that population up and, and that's Absolutely. a resident population so even though we're only shooting a dozen a year, and some years are way less than that, that dozen are from the valley. Yeah. They're, they're staying. So, you know, there's some up in Alamo, mm-hmm. up in that area. So if we can give them room to grow and, and reproduce and, and all that stuff, you can have a viable population oh, of them. It takes conservatives to do that. Hey, and something else with the banquet. Um, I know something that really helps us out the wind banquet is, I mean, buying tables is great, but another big thing is donations. So if you're a private little business and you make a product or you just want your name out there, I mean, if you go buy a, a box of decoys and say, hey, listen, this is from mm-hmm. this is from my uh, farmer's insurance company. This is my box of decoys. Put my, put my name on it when you put it out there. Like, that goes a long way at those banquets to make them, to, like, desirable and enjoyable to go to. Yeah, absolutely. Underwriting and sponsor- sponsorships are a huge thing for these banquets because some of the materials we have to buy for the banquets, the less we actually have to buy as far as raffle prices go, um, the better off it is for DU. We actually got, <laughs> first year the Golden Knights were around, after their first season, we ended up getting a... Um, hockey stick from them that was signed by the entire first year. Oh, I had to, that sell for bank right there. It was donated to us and it, it, we put it in a live auction and it went, um, yeah, it went for a lot of money. It was really cool. It was way more than I could spend on it. I was kind of disappointed about that, but <laughs> it really did a very good job of making the dinner successful. Cause it was a, it was a one time only 
really, really cool thing for the dinner. Well, I don't know how you do it for Ducks and Limit. I know if, uh, friends of the NRA when we do that stuff. So you can underwrite. It's not just if you want to get a raffle prize or something like that and say, hey, mm-hmm. here's these decoys. Go ahead and put them in your raffle. We do – you can underwrite every every part of our banquet. Correct. So if you want to we, – we have a standard package that we have to buy. So that standard package is a, is a set price. But if you want to buy this item out of the standard package, maybe it's 50 bucks. Mm-hmm. All the way up to where you can sponsor the whole dinner for like ten grand, right? Yep. So, so if you have those, every little bit of that that you can do, that's just more profit that goes back into that club. Absolutely. And, and so, those are a lot of times better than, not I would say better than buying a ticket because if you buy a dinner ticket, chances are you're gonna Spend buy some raffle tickets. Anyways. You're gonna go and and you know maybe buy an auction item or mm-hmm. something like that. But it is a great way that. You get a more bang for your buck out of the underwriting you're going to do with just about anything else. Yeah, correct. you know, you buy a dinner ticket, fifty bucks or forty bucks or whatever that dinner ticket is going to buy dinner. Mm-hmm. You know, th- these clubs, it's not cheap. Yeah, you know, to buy these dinners anymore at these casinos. So, what are you going to have at your dinner? What's, what's going to be the dinner this year? Do you know uh, yet? Uh, we're still kind of hammering that out. It's either going to be chicken or chicken or steak. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's all going to be plated. We we used to do buffets. Oh, they can't. Do but that you this can't year, do. Probably. These are big old prime rib, right? Exactly. Yeah, we used to have salmon and prime rib and all sorts of. I mean, it it was wonderful, but yeah. uh, it's all going to be plated from now on, um, which is it's good and bad. Plating's nice because you get your food pretty quickly. You don't have to stand in line, and some people don't like that, and and I get that. Um, I back in the eighties, it was all barbecue that you just stand in line and you get your brisket or dogs or whatnot, and it was a a little different feel back then, um, but it's all fun. See, all we fun. do. We did for our friends at area. We did smoke prime rib, but we did mm-hmm. it ourselves. Yeah. So we would smoke it all ourselves, and you know, it's it's a lot cheaper that way. But you can't do that in the Vegas area because your venues are all. That's where they're making their money. The funny thing is, I did. I just did a banquet at South Point. We did it for um, Mercy Ambulance. We had mm-hmm. our, our reunion, and they everything was buffet style with that one. It was, really? it was crazy. So we had prime rib, we had turkey, and they're all paramedics. They're all yeah. Dirty. They figure you're gonna die anyway. So you know, <laughs> I already had COVID. You already got COVID. Times. Like yeah, you guys are walking COVID. So, but yeah, it was uh, it was pretty interesting just to actually have a buffet open again. But it was different because they can't touch your silverware, they can't touch your plates. They have to serve them everything. Oh, they have to give you the scoop out yeah, of it. You have, can't scoop your own. Exactly. Okay. So it's it's a little bit different, but but it still was, you know, it was okay. Mm-hmm. Um, we had Corona's. It, it's put a, a it's damper on a lot of things. It's messed up all these conservation so groups. We got uh, Woods and Waters, got, or not Woods and Waters, Wind got really lucky because we were the very last banquet before everything shut down. Yeah. You know, it was like we had our banquet, and that next week, Everything was done. That was, we actually had the Continental shoot last year, and the next week, immediately after the Continental shoot, done, 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 done. Allie. I mean, we got we got the Continental shoot in right before it happened, and then Henderson's event got completely canceled. Yeah. Now, with these sponsors, and like, just from my standpoint, when I see a sponsor at a DU banquet or at a Wind banquet or at a Bighorn fraternity banquet, like when I see these sponsors, it's great advertising for your business too because those are the people I go and shop at. Because one, I know they love conservation, mm-hmm. and I know the money is typically going to go back into conservation, you know, because they're willing to spend that money. And so, from a business standpoint, if you have a small business that's looking to donate to Ducks Limited, like they should reach out to you and do it because it's it's also great advertising that they get a write off. Correct. Correct. It, it, Additionally, at our banquets, we tend to, and I'm sure you guys see the same thing, you get a lot of people that actually network during the banquets. They show up, they can chat with others that are like-minded, but also maybe in the same same general location. You know, there's a, there's a lot of construction workers and a lot of, a lot of companies that buy tables and they know each other and they say hi, and it helps keep the community more tight-knit, I think, and expand your horizons at the same well, time. Well, those companies, a lot of them bounce from banquet to banquet, right? So they, yeah. they tend to hit all of the all of the banquets, and, and some of them are a little bit more loyal to, to this or whatever because maybe I don't hunt big game, but I hunt ducks, or maybe I don't hunt ducks, but I hunt, you know, I'll hunt bighorn, right? Bighorn. So so you're going to get those a little bit, but what I've seen is you go, go to these banquets, there's a few players that are at every single one of them. Yes. You know, and so it, it, 
it is kind of like you're going and seeing some of the same guys, you know, quite a bit. Mm-hmm. And then you, for me, you go to realize, you know, with, with my work, I, I'll go to a banquet and it'll be somebody that I know through work as well. So mm-hmm. you form those relationships, those conversations are a little easier after that. So they're now, fun. Why don't, you, why don't you tell who some of your favorite sponsors are, Brian, that you see at every banquet? You said there's a few that are there every single time. Well, I mean, it's you, you go into the big the construction companies, right? Mm-hmm. They're they're always there. You know, I know High Rock Constructions at a lot of these banquets. I know, you know, we have one particular individual that that always buys the mule deer tag every year, and, and you know, those guys you're going to see him every time. And if if he's not doing it here, he's going to do it somewhere else. But you, you do have you have I, I know for win for our win program we have CCW Maggie that comes out and she's yep. there every Maggie's single wonderful. year and she always spends money she always donates stuff mm-hmm. you know we we get we get fishing charters for ours and and the cool thing is and I don't know what you guys have for the hunts and stuff but you know there's usually safaris and stuff that you can buy at these or maybe it's a waterfowl hunt in Argentina and yep. you know you have all these different options and. Sometimes those go pretty affordable. I, I mean, it, it's not what you think they are for price a lot of times. And, you know, the cool thing is that, A, you're you're having an opportunity to get some pretty cool items because mm-hmm. there's always something that's kind of a one-off at these banquets. Not only are you getting that, but you know that even if you win absolutely nothing, that everything you spent is going to go back into creating a better habitat. So, so it it's a huge thing. I mean, it, we, we need that habitat. We need the growth. We need every organization that, that is in that conservation mindset. We need to support them all because. Here, I want to tell you my favorite. Even just a second. If, even if you're all doing a different species, mm-hmm. that habitat's going to affect the habitat next to it. They're going to intermingle in some fashion. And, and, and so if we can get all of those things to grow and everything connects, mm-hmm. then every habitat's going to be great. So. Yep. Whether it's bighorn or we're, we're doing the bighorn and that that affects guzzlers and then I get more mule deer and that, that affects that project and then it goes all the way down the line. So yep. it's going to be a great thing. So who's your favorite, Ron? You, man. You, you support all of them, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't support any. <laughs> no. They, My favorite guy that I think is always there at every single stinking banquet is New Frontier Armory. Oh, yeah. Those uh, guys are all stars in the community. Hold on. I'm not done yet. I got more. I got more. The next one that, like, you don't, they don't say anything, and they're not, like, New Frontier Army probably makes millions a year, especially now with how guns are. The next one is George's Alignment. Like, those guys, I know you probably haven't heard of them. I have not. They always buy a couple's table, and they always spend a lot of money. Nice. And they always, and they do a really good job on your car. Like, I brought several, several cars to them. Um and they're always there. So there's these little mom and pop shops mm-hmm. that show up, and they do good work. Like you have someone that always donates to the kids auction. Who's that? That's Sherry Goldstrom. Uh, oh, Art's like, Art's wife. Art's daughter. Daughter. Yeah, Art's the daughter. Goldstrom family. Don't they own a mechanic shop or something. Like they actually there? own a car museum. They, yeah, I used to, I used to clean Art's yard when I was a little kid. So, Art's been a staple of Las Vegas for, I think he started in. I want to say it was like 52. He started out driving a water truck out to the test site. Um, he scraped up enough money, drove out, filled it up, drove it out to the test site, waited till they needed water, irrigate, uh, created some dust control or, or whatever he needed to do, drove back to Vegas, filled it back up, drove it back out there. He ate, slept, and lived in that water truck until he scraped up enough money that he could start his uh, demolition business. Yeah, he's he's been a staple in this town. Do you have anybody else that always shows up to all of your banquets? Yes, uh, that would be Summit Construction, Chuck Berenger. That man, um, during the economic downturn in the mid two thousands, uh, we were scraping by. Nobody had any money. Uh, construction was failing in Las Vegas, right? Um, Chuck was always there. Chuck and and the Goldstroms were always there, supporting and helping us. I I, I actually those two I say definitely got us through the hardest years and yeah. they're wonderful i love them to death the other one i think does a lot for not not just for co- the conservation side but just about anything is we just talked to him the other day jason with bex i mean bex sunglasses has been he, he gives back to so many different organizations and, and stuff right. like that and you know he's one of those guys that 
you know, we, we had him at our banquet for our NRA banquet one year, and he bought a, bought he bought a table, mm-hmm. and so we have a different we have a couple of different packages. So you can buy a, a six hundred fifty dollar table. There's no guns involved, yeah. and then once you hit a thousand dollars, there's a gun at every table, right? And he bought it. He bought a table, and then he came in, and I don't even want to know what he spent at that at that <laughs> banquet. But he was. We do one of our auctions every year is is a veterans auction. So that item, you you get it. It's a statue or whatever. You buy it and you give it away. So you give it to a veteran that's in the room. That's awesome. And so they do either an oldest veteran or youngest veteran or however they want to do it, right? And so Jason went and bought that item, and he spent 1500 bucks or whatever it was on it and went and gave it to the veteran in the room. Well, we have this guy that owns High Rock Construction, John Hymas, that mm-hmm. you know him and Jason are buddies. And so Jason did that. John Hymas bought the next item and told me, he goes, well, I wanted to go to the other veteran. You know, so he did the other one. So those guys, when you can do things like that, and they're not doing it. They're not doing it for the praise. Yeah, they're not doing no. it for the praise. They're not doing it for the the stuff. They're just doing it because they want to. They're doing they it because it's, it's a great yeah. thing to do, and, and it's supporting a cause that they like. So, And I think that's – we have to do better, I think, sometimes as as organizations NCOs. about getting, getting the money in the seats, right? Yes, and, and and so it's part of it's how you set your banquet up, right? Where do you where do you set your tables? Mm-hmm. Which people do you put up front? You know, and and for us, sometimes it's just that ask, right? So we go out and say, hey, why don't you come to my banquet? And they're like, you know, I didn't, even, I wasn't even thinking about that. And so we we really do need to do that. Is we need to go out and go to people and say, hey, come support us. And I think they're they're willing to. A lot of these companies are really willing to. And, and right now in the construction industry. There's so much money in the construction industry right now that none of them are hurting for money. You yeah. know, it's the, they're all making it. Well, I guess to a certain point, there's there's a couple sectors that got hit. Whether you know, there's some companies, some bigger companies that got shut down on the border wall, and, and that was a big financial hit for a lot of those companies. But the good thing is, there's such a robust construction market on top of that that I think most of those will do fairly well pretty quickly. So you go. The companies that didn't have it, you know, during the last crash, mm-hmm. now have the ability to, to give back where they haven't before. So I think it's it's a great time. And and the other thing is, they didn't spend anything last year, right? So yep. these these companies that normally give, you know, they'll spend two thousand dollars on tables. Well, they didn't do it last year, so okay, let's buy four tables instead mm-hmm. of two, right? So I I think there's some opportunity there for sure, and and you know it, it's. People have been cooped up for so long. It's time to get out of the house and have some fun, and it's the perfect opportunity. That's that's a hundred percent. I'm hoping we can have a, a for this Henderson event that's coming up. I'm hoping it's going to be just a banner event for Henderson because people haven't done things. I mean, you can if you attend all the banquets, you can kind of get a little bit of of burnout on the banquets because you yeah. you see the same people, you you see sometimes the same type of stuff, and I get that. I I, I do truly understand, but. We haven't had a banquet in well over a year, really. Um, so I'm I'm hoping we can stir some interest and get some happy people. Well, you've people. got pretty limited seats to it, too. Yeah, so unfortunately, we should be able to put 300-odd people in this room. But they're at this point in time, they're limiting this to 150. We should be closer to 200 um, in June, depending on what opens how they can, you know, reshuffle things and what our governor says, basically. At our win bank, we had 500. And so I'm afraid, like, after doing this podcast, that your, your tables are going to go too quick, you know. And so if people want it, they probably ought to jump on. And this is me just being a salesman because I'm a real estate agent. I honestly think people are going to want to get out. Yeah. And, like, once the seats are gone, the seats are gone. Well, we have a, we had an influx of sportsmen this year, too. I mean, it's probably the busiest hunting year we ever had because people were locked up and they couldn't do anything else, right? So. Mm-hmm. These people that are out hunting, and hopefully people got bit by the bug, and it's like, hey, uh, this sounds like a good thing. And people don't realize sometimes, okay, it's whether it's Ducks Unlimited or whether it's the Wind Group or whatever, you're going to go around those people. And if it's a duck hunting club, there are probably going to be some tips on how to duck hunt. Just mm-hmm. just thought. So, so you yeah, can go you get a free piece of advice every yeah, time you show up from Jason, guaranteed. It, well, it, but <laughs> every hundred dollars spent. But Ron and I, we we talk about it all the time. So, part of the thing with Win, if you come out and do projects with you, mm-hmm. we're going to have conversations, and sometimes those oh, conversations yeah. are going to be like, "Oh yeah, we really like to hunt this spot, and this is why we like to hunt this spot." And it's not 
we're not using it saying, hey, if you want to know the secret, you got to come with us. But it's just a natural part of conversation, right? Mm-hmm. You get guys around, you start talking about stuff, and, oh, yeah, I was over here and I hunted this. It was really great last year. And so it gives you another idea of a spot to go to that you maybe you wouldn't have thought about. So, And if you don't have anybody to hunt with, like a lot of guys complain, oh, I don't know anybody to hunt with. Yeah. Pay 150 bucks. Well, 150 bucks for a couple, right? Yeah. Probably ought to bring your wife or your girlfriend. I don't know. Or your and wife it, and your girlfriend. Well, yeah, your, both. Wife, your wife will talk to everybody, so it's perfect. And then she'll be like, you should hunt with my husband. He doesn't have any but friends. But if you leave mm-hmm. your wife at home, you can spend more money without her knowing. That's true. That's true. Hey, and you can always say, listen, it was just a donation. It was just a donation. I was just donating. You know, are you mad at me for giving to charity? You spent $5,000 you know? <laughs> on that. It's all right off a bowl, you know? She doesn't have to know you put 500 bucks in a raffle bucket for the shotgun you wanted. <laughs> Ron put $500 in the raffle bucket for some Crocs. <laughs> what? Oh, yeah, man. The limited edition Ducks Unlimited Crocs. Going got for the them. Luke Comb fuzzy ones? <laughs> with, with, with the dingle balls on the back? Yeah, I wear those because like, Brian likes the way they look on me. So Going out Crocs? <laughs> going, am, I going, am I going on the town Crocs? They're high heels, too. <laughs> anyway. Hey, Jay, what's your feeling about Crocs? Do you wear Crocs when you go duck hunting? No. I will oh, man, you got another never friend, wear Brian. a pair of Crocs in my life. I tried it once. See, you tried it once. Good old college try. Uh, well, yeah, it but... was really hot outside, and they were my sons. So. Oh, were they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> His wrist started, wrist started to get a little limp, so he's like, yeah, I got to take these things off. Yeah. <laughs> hey, man, I, there, there's like two There's two mindsets on the cross. You either love them or you hate them. I uh-huh. think... There's like no middle ground. Like, yeah, I kind of yeah. like them. No, it's either love or hate. Well, and I was actually reading a thing the other day. It was talking so Brian about... hates Crocs so much it makes him homophobic. Yeah. <laughs> the, they, the, they were talking about Crocs, and actually the – the Crocs stock is like through the roof and they supposedly they're supposed to be better for your feet. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, nothing that ugly can be good for you. That's... Ryan can't wear them anymore. He's made fun of them too much now. <sighs> anymore. I never have worn them. Thank goodness. My oldest son actually <laughs> for Sadie Hawkins, his date got him, got them matching Crocs for Sadie Hawkins. What I'm talking about. It was horrible. I'm going to shake his hand. Uh, Is he going to be at the banquet? He will. Absolutely. I can't My talk, family always goes to the banquet. I can't talk too much about kids and goofy stuff. My kid's got the world's greatest mullet right now. So, Yeah, that's my youngest. He's working on the Patrick Mahomes curly, long, kind of everywhere, except right on the sides where it should be gray. It's it's not even a mullet. I mean, I don't even know how to describe it. Do they know, like, like 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, their kids are going to wear those as Halloween costumes to make fun of them? Yeah, they don't. They, they, it's going to happen, they though. Don't, they don't think that far ahead. No, it's hard true. to get them to think about what's happening tomorrow. You got a favorite story hunting with your kid. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we were actually out at Overton for the youth hunt. Um. Actually, I got two stories. Okay. Both same child. Um, we're sitting in the blind, sitting in the blind. And uh, if you've ever been out to Overton, you know that there's a bunch of hawks that fly over and kind of just look around, see what they can find. Um, we're sitting in the blind and there's a hawk and all of a sudden I hear a coot squealing. <laughs> and this hawk was actually circling over the coot. And it just got lower and lower and lower. And the coot couldn't really go anywhere on the water. They don't take off real well anyway to begin with. But this hawk literally just flew around. And I've got my two children and then a a friend of the family, um, uh, another little girl with us. And we're watching this hawk fly around. Hawk ends up landing on the coot and starts drowning it. So what? I've never seen anything like this in my life. I've yeah. seen birds pick up stuff up dry. I've, I've, you know, I've seen fish in hawk's hands. I've seen all sorts of things. But it was amazing. Um, so we're watching it for a while, and, and all of a sudden, a couple mallards come in, and my oldest stands up, shoots, shoots one of the mallards, uh-huh. drops it. My yellow lab, happy as a clam. Hawk flies away in the meanwhile. Runs out there, grabs a coop, brings it back. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like Rock's got a new buddy. <laughs> That's it was, awesome. It was awesome. That's Rock's <laughs> best friend right there. <laughs> That's so hilarious. He's like, oh, man, thanks for doing all the work, buddy. Uh-huh. <laughs> What's the second story you the, got? The second story was my youngest. I'm taking him out to Key Pittman opening day. 
He's got a single shot 20 gauge, and I think he's probably he's probably t- nine or ten years old. Okay, Daddy, I'm gonna I'm gonna shoot the head off of a duck. <laughs> shoot him in the face. I, I'm, 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 that's an admirable idea. I mean, it'll, it'll definitely be dead at that point in time. Yeah, and. He told me that for like three days before we actually before opening day, and finally <laughs> the night before, up, huh? he was so excited about shooting the head off a duck, and and I, I that night putting him in bed, I'm like, look, man, um, I got to tell you, you don't expect to do that. I've been hunting for <laughs> over thirty years now, and I've never actually shot the head off of a duck, so it may not happen this time. I'm just going to throw that out there. <laughs> We go out early morning, opening day, sun comes up, teal come by, first shot of the day, whack! I walk over there, pick up the duck, it's missing its head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, goals, man. <laughs> you know, Ron and I got to see something pretty cool this weekend. We we went up to Otter Creek to do a fishing tournament up there, and we, hunt, we fished hot, Otter Creek on Saturday, and then we Fish penguins Shout on Sunday. Shout out to Woods and Water for taking yeah, us. Sh- yeah, thanks, Woods and Water. Man. It's always a great time. But So we're out there, and, man, I have never seen this many McAnsers anywhere. I mean, they were <laughs> everywhere, right? So there's we're out fishing, and there's a mallard pair sitting on the water. Mm-hmm. And we're like, oh, that's a nice mallard pair. You know, they're just chilling. They're paired up. Yeah. Here comes this mallard circling above, and he comes right in, comes on the water. These two mallards go at it. And the mallard that was flying came in. Kicked him off of the off of it, flew off with the hen, and then for the next ten minutes, that original mallard was just swimming around, just throwing a fit. Yeah, he was pissed. <laughs> he was I never heard of that except for an overtone. Someone was trying to call. So <laughs> yeah, it was, but it was pretty cool to just watch that you know, that whole pattern go. And uh, I love being out there. It's it's every time you go out, you see something new. Oh yeah, I mean, and and. and it's just wonderful. We were out here one time, and we were out with Ron Cannon, and these two teal come buzzing across us. Also, this hawk comes down, just boom, nabs it right out of the air. Wow. It was, you remember that? Like, we were yeah. so busy watching the hawk, we didn't shoot at the teal. Well, it's just, I mean, anytime you go out, I mean, there's always, you go hunting, and there's always going to be a story of some sort that you can tell, you know. Mm-hmm. That was my boy, we were hunting blind five at Overton, and he, he hits a teal, and and he cripples his teal, and it goes all the way back side of the pond. So I'm walking across, walking across. I got my gun. I'm walking out there. I get within, like, five feet of this teal, and it picks up off water and flies straight at me. So I pick up, and I drop it. And I got, like, a leg and, like, three feathers. <laughs> I'm walking back to my kid. <laughs> I was shooting. I think I was shooting number two, three and a half. So it was oh, just my like... goodness. He has goose load in. But it was just – it was, and it was an instinct shot, right? Uh-huh. He, he comes at you. You, you want to drop him because – Obviously, he's crippled. You know, you don't want to. Yeah, you want to be fair. And, and so, man, I come back to him. I don't think we're going to get anything on this one. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best thing about having a dog is he'll chase it down for you, uh-huh, and they don't yeah. get off the water as quick with the dog coming at them. You know, and that's the that's the thing is, that, I mean, there is always. I mean, we we have a great time when we go out. <clears throat> and the cool thing about duck hunting, it's unique to any other form of of hunting. So. You can do it a little bit with pheasant and stuff. Like you with pheasant, you can talk to your guys that are with you a little bit, but you still have to be kind of quiet. Yeah. You're hunting. You're, it's a solitary hunt, right? Elk yeah. hunting, solitary. And a duck blind, you can bust everybody's balls, and then the ducks start coming. Everybody shuts up, mm-hmm. and you shoot some ducks, and you go right back to it again. Yeah, you know. And, and so it is a, a lot more social form of hunting. So it's enjoyable for the new guys to get at because even if you're not shooting ducks, you're out there on the water. You're having a good time. Mm-hmm. You know. Uh, we don't, I mean, there are guys that will go out there and drink, which I think is the stupidest idea you can ever do. You got guns. Yeah, and, really bad idea. And alcohol. And, what, is it easy to shoot somebody with a shotgun? Yeah, Big well, spread? well, and, and you look at some of these blinds in Overton, and the backs of the doors are loaded with with steel shot. You know, I mean, people are, are already dangerous enough in, in some mm-hmm. of these areas, but you add that alcohol to the mix, and it's you're just asking for it, right? Uh, yeah, it's, it's it's never a good idea to mix firearms and alcohol. I don't I, no. I I get it. It it can be fun, but no, it's it if so, the potential for something to go south is 
seriously increased when you start to impair any of your senses. Well, I love it. I love to sit down and have a good Battleborn beer, but you know, there's time for that afterwards, right? So it's in the cooler back at the truck. So you, yeah. you're forming bonds and, and those bonds. I mean, we go with the woods and waters guys and do these <laughs> fishing derbies and stuff like that. And you know, it, it, you're going to be drinking afterwards, but yeah. the guys aren't drinking when they're out on the ice and stuff. So it, it's just Wait, about when they're fishing. They're, they're some of, some of those guys are, but but the creel it's cold out there, man. But it's about it's really about doing it, and and everything about duck hunting is is doing it responsibly. So mm-hmm. doing it, the, the, we want to if we're going to harvest, <clears throat> we want clean kills, right? And yeah. So there's actually I think it's boss ammunition or something like that boss shot shells boss shot shells it's a it's a that was his whole reason for designing a new shot shell is because he was sick of seeing cripples yeah and, right. and so his design was to limit the number of cripples you have and mm-hmm. and i think that's an admirable goal right and so if we're shooting ducks at 85 yards well if you hit them you're probably just going to cripple them and, and, and they're going to fly and they're going to go die somewhere but it's going to take yep. them a while lock their wings sail another 300 yards away from and you and you'll never see them again and they across Nesbit man you're not getting them yeah no. it, that lake is deep quick yeah. and like you said Overton's easy to hunt because it's all shallow you know everything's walkable at Overton Honeybee's a little sketch center pond's a little deep one spot <laughs> there's one spot yeah but but like for the most part you get it but Nesbit if you sell that bird across the lake just Wave well, goodbye to it. You can't send your dog oh, yeah. after it or anything. No. Well, it's, and we did that. We were up in the Rubies for opener this year, and and I dropped a mallard, and it was, I mean, it was fairly close. It wasn't a bad shot, and he went straight down, right into a group of reeds. And we we never found him, and we yes. had the dog on him, and so you just got to be careful with some of your shots, mm-hmm. you know, because the goal was to get birds and, and take birds home and, and mm-hmm. you know, have some, some nice duck meat to yep. have for dinner. So And not to waste, well, not to waste wild game. You know, and that's the biggest thing. I, I think that's the hardest thing, honestly, for new hunters is there's two things that are difficult. A, judging their shot distance, right? Because it's not a deer. You're not going to hit it 150 yards. As, as much as you think you can, you're not going to. B is being able to identify ducks and, and what you're shooting yep. and, and make an educated guess. There's a there's a book. I think it's called the Masters. It's a waterfowl guide. Okay. And it's got it's got a beak identifier. It's really cool. Takes a bird, sets a beak on it, tells you what what yep. what duck it is. But what one of the other great things that that book does is it gives you flight levels of your standard birds. So if they're just on a normal flight pattern, mm-hmm. where they're gonna be. So like your, we all know the buffaloes are gonna be right up on the water, yep. and they're gonna be scooting right across the top of the water. You know, your mallards are going to be your high ducks, and there's going to be stuff in between. So you can do a lot of that research up front, but there is no, there's nothing like seeing the birds over and over and over again. And a couple years into it, you're just like 100 yards away, you're like, oh, that's a mallard. Yeah. That's a redhead. You know, you, you know the pintails have got a big fat head. So, you know, you can see it, you can spot a pintail from 12 counties away, yeah. you know, and so it gets easier with time and so the, the new hunters a lot of times they get frustrated because they don't know what they're mm-hmm. what they're looking at what they're shooting at i've got a question for jason when you're done so it, i think it's important for us to take these new hunters out okay. and and help them identify ducks as they're flying so they're not getting a visit from green jeans because they shot a scout the day before, day before opening. opening for scalp you yeah. know and because that's the only in nevada that's the only <laughs> split season right the scalp mm-hmm. is, a, is a late season compared to everything else yeah and, and you know, so everything else we can kind of, it's kind of easy, work right? Work. Yeah. Uh, it's a duck. It's flying like a duck. You know, it doesn't have a super long neck. It's not swimming on the water. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, it's a duck. Now we did. There's been some issues with the youth hunts in there shooting some swans and some geese or whatever. You know, and the youth hunts. Yeah, the geese. Uh-huh. They they did a. What they do? They did a pelican one year, I think. Oh yeah, hunt. that makes sense. And, and, and so, but it's. That's on the parents, and that's on whoever's taking those kids out, right? That's my one most important thing, shoot or don't shoot. That comes down to distance, identification, everything is shoot or don't shoot. Yeah, we, we've got to do a better job of teaching people that. So if you see people doing it the wrong way, it, it, the best thing you can do is get them into a blind with you. you mm-hmm. know, and, yeah, mentor and, and try to teach them the right way. And that's Ron. Why we really started the podcast, that was the idea is, you know, we get some of these guys in, we can mentor them a little bit, say, hey, yeah, absolutely, this is a good time to shoot. This is not, this is, you know, give you some tips to make you a better hunter. There's plenty of birds to go around. Yep. You know. Hey, so Jason, what, yes, I, got, I got a couple questions here. What is your favorite duck? And then 
Second, if someone's going to spend money on duck hunting equipment, where would you spend the money? All right. Um, I think my favorite duck is actually a canvas back. I oh, love sound like cans. a true Nesbitt hunter. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, they fly fast. You can see them. I mean, it, once you figure out the difference between a canvas back and a redhead, redhead on the wing, man, you can just tell. They're screaming along. They're designed for speed. They got that beak that's just a perfect wedge shape. They're a beautiful duck when they're in full feather. Um, yeah, I love myself some cans. Yeah. Um, as far as what equipment... <laughs> What's what if you were if you were to tell one new guy what should he spend his money on? Waiters, get a good set of waiters, man. Because, well, depends on where you're hunting, obviously. Um, Key Pittman, if you're trying to hunt <laughs> Nesbit in the marshy area, the water's shallow, but the mud's real deep. So if you think you can get away with a pair of hip boots, well, you might be able to. Chances are you're not going to have a very good time if you have to sit down. Yeah. So in, in my opinion, buy a good set of waders. That's going to be one of it, other than guns and shot and whatnot and camo gear. Um, you can get away with lesser quality camo gear. Think of how, you know, I don't, I don't know about your, your parents and grandparents. Mine shot in all sorts of neat stuff. Half of it was just kind of green-ish or, yeah. you know, plaid. They just went out and shot. Red plaid shirt. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so camo, you can get away. You don't need the latest Sitka gear. You don't, you know, as long as you can stay warm and put a camouflage tarp over the top, you know. Go or you could tuck good into the brush. Exactly. You, you know, my, I think probably, probably the best piece of gear that I ever bought was actually my waiter jacket. I mean, that's. Waiter jacket? Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's a waiter parka. So it's designed to be worn with your waiters over the top of it. So it's oh, a little okay. bit shorter. Mm -hmm. um, but man, that's the most most, probably the most comfortable piece of gear I own. And when you're talking about duck hunting, we're, we're, we're hunting. It's, you know, there's a lot of days. It is designed for duck hunting. I mean, it has boxes for your shotgun shells. It's nice. nice hip pockets I, up top. I was literally sweating in sub-zero temperatures out at, out at Sunnyside in that jacket. And, and so for me, that, that comfort that came with that. And it's not, mm -hmm. they're, they're made to be in the water, so you're not going to be wet. You know, a good set of waders is great having two sets of waders or a convertible set that you can have an early season set and a late uh -huh. set is, is a great thing. Cause you don't want to wear 1600 gram waders when you're right. it's 85 degrees out, you know? And when it's, when it's 20 degrees out and blowing and snowing and raining, you definitely don't want that super light pair of Gore-Tex stocking foot waders. Yeah. Cause you no. just can't keep the heat in. Like I think a lot, I think duck hunting gets a bad rap because people go out with bad equipment for the first time and then they never want to go out again. If you go out with cold, good equipment and sit in the cold, it is it is is enjoyable. It's a hundred. It's a game changer. Well, and it's funny because Ron used to make fun of me because I would get, I'll get the hand warmers. Mm -hmm. I'll always yeah. have some hand warmers. For, actually, I was up, we were going up to uh, Nesbit one day, and I stopped at at our place because that's our favorite place uh -huh. ever. And I bought they had the heated insoles, right? For the your toe boots. warmers. Well, this one was a full insole, so I put that in my waders, and man, that was that was super comfort right there, <laughs> man. My my feet were warm all day, but. So Ron would make fun of me about these hand warmers, and then he took some hand warmers one day, and then after that, he's like, well, i got to get more hand warmers. So I buy a box every season and leave them in the truck. Yeah, and, and that's those little that things. Up your core, man. Yeah. Those little yeah. things help a lot. I mean, oh, they really amazingly. do. amazingly. i taking my kids out with me and taking other kids out with me. I bring a thermos of hot chocolate for them because they can be cold, but if you start feeding them a little bit of a little bit of hot chocolate that's nice and warm, if you if you can build up that heat from the inside, it makes the day a lot more pleasant. Plus, kids love hot chocolate. That's so, a really good tip. I never thought about that. Yeah. We we did this year for the first time. So we take the boat out to Sunnyside, mm -hmm. and we started doing sausage and white bread on the water. So sausage, white bread, and cheese. You know, cook it up on a little grill. Yeah. And the first day we did it, it literally was probably the worst duck hunt of the season. We get to the water, and it's started raining then it was sleet then it was snow the hail was hitting was blowing so hard you couldn't open your eyes oh to look goodness. at ducks there were no ducks flying but man you there might that, have been we couldn't see yeah. yeah but you get that we made some sausages and white bread and that sausage is steaming hot you eat that man it was just like it changes your whole perspective you want on to life. know where we got the idea from uh, there's a song there's actually a song talking about have you heard the duck blind song no 
Oh, okay, we'll play it for you after this. Well, Brian could put it on the Indie credits. Maybe. But yeah, there's a it's it's called the Duck Blind. It's on the uh, Bone, Collector. Bone Collector album. Okay, and so it's just all a collection of hunting songs. But they talk about first, uh, I don't miss a miss. I just shoot him in the face, you know, <laughs> and then, uh, sausage on my grill and a piece of white bread, you know. Okay. And so I know back in the south that's a big thing. So mm-hmm. we out west, we, we're thinking, oh, duck blind. So we, if we get a box blind, we're good. If we get a <laughs> we get a sunk blind, sometimes we'll just brush in an area and call it a blind. Back in the south, they have like two story blinds with full kitchens on them, TVs. You know, uh, I mean, they go take a nap and then Eggs go back out bacon. to the porch to shoot mm-hmm. to shoot birds. Yeah. So they got a whole different variety of duck blind out there than we got. But you know, it is it. Those little things can change your entire perspective because mm-hmm. they make the trip so much more enjoyable. Cold and miserable is hard to take, especially if you're having a if it's a slow day. There's yeah. not a lot of ducks, and, and then you're cold and miserable on top of it, and. We we joke if you're gonna be a duck hunter, you better like to be miserable because you're in some of the worst. When, when the conditions are the worst, that's when you want to hunt. Exactly. So um, there was an old one of the last great white hunters was a gentleman named Robert Rurick. Uh, I post about him all the time about Battleborn duck hunters. He's amazing. He wrote two books: the old man and the boy, and the old. Well, he actually wrote a lot. I mean, he was writing for um, Outdoor Life and a bunch of different magazines. But he actually has. If you haven't read the old man and the boy. Read the old man and the boy. It's about growing up in North Carolina, fishing, hunting, um, and a lot of it goes around duck hunting. And he's convinced that you have to be a masochist to be a duck hunter because <laughs> the worse weather you can find, the better the ducks are going to fly for you. They're going to hunker down low. They're going to stick down. You're going to be able to get the shots off, and they want to land, but they also want to get up. Yeah, no, that's true. I, I I love that guy, and I love the quotes he puts up, and I. Like you'll see them all the time on the Battleborn Duckers. Yep. Yeah, uh, that's Facebook page. That is. I mean, it. You're going to be if you're hunting. I mean, we hunt a lot out of kayaks, and so you're going to pitch the kayaks back into the reeds. And a lot of times we're sitting right in the water. Mm-hmm. You know, sitting in the water, sitting on a stool in the water, but you're in the water wet. And the one of the, the the hard part is, you get in your waders, they're nice and warm, but man, that pressure on your feet after a while. You know, it, it's it's not the most comfortable experience in the world, but no. you know what? It's enjoyable. The peace that you get out of there. I mean, it's some of, you're going to see some of the most beautiful sunsets you'll ever see. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, even going into Overton. I mean, I see a lot sunset. of sunsets because you don't shoot limits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you have to shoot longer than the morning? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Especially if you're in over. If you're in Overton, yeah, if you're done by noon, you're good. (laughs) Sometimes you're done by noon and you ain't good. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes you're done by noon and you've seen three ducks. Well, why don't you tell us one more time about this banquet coming up here? All right. The Henderson Banquet's coming up on June 12th. Um, We'd love to see anybody there that that would like to come join us. We're uh, a pretty, pretty open group. Smiling faces. Uh, tickets go for eighty-five dollars for a single, one hundred and fifty dollars for a couple. Green wings are only forty-five dollars. Anybody under eighteen years old comes in, comes in, eats a full dinner, gets a subscription to Ducks Unlimited magazine for forty-five dollars. Uh, corporate tables are at six hundred dollars right now. Um, that's corporate tables of six. Uh, and for every five corporate tables we sell, we're going to throw another uh, Great Gun giveaway banner in there. So for the sell, tables, for the tables only. Nice. Um, yeah, if we sell ten tables. If we sell twenty tables, uh, if we sell twenty tables, we'll have four gu- uh, four diff- separate chances to win guns for the corporate tables alone. Well, Jason, you're a good guy, man, and doing this for twelve years and doing it because you don't want to die. That this says uh, so much about you and so much for what you do. And, um, you know, like we, we have a saying, show up or shut up. And you've been showing up for a long time. So um, yeah, it's for a good cause. I mean, if I can help, I'd like to. We know the time and effort that goes into it. And if, if people are listening to this and can support you, do. Because Jason's working his butt off, man. What and he's because he loves ducks. If they can't. If they can't afford to go to the banquet or, or you just don't have a time and it doesn't day doesn't work for you, at least go buy a subscription. You know, yeah. buy, get a membership to Ducks Unlimited. It's like thirty bucks. Buy a calendar. And, and man, the, the Ducks Unlimited subscription or the <laughs> membership is thirty bucks, and normally you'll get something with that thirty bucks. Yeah, I've had I've got jackets out of it. I've got a nice shirts, sets, jackets, shirts, correct. you know, whatever. Calls. The app and the, and the DU app. Mm-hmm. I mean, Ron and I use the journal quite a bit. Ron uses it. I didn't even use it this year. Ron uses it every year. 
to you, journalism. You got your ducks. ducks to put in put in your journals, right? <laughs> yeah, I just figure you take credit for all my ducks anyway, so they're already counted. That's true. <laughs> Go on, double count them. But no, so um, it's an excellent app. It's it's got a great thing with you know when shooting light is and sunrise it, sunset timer is awesome the, on it the if you have an android phone the cool thing about the android phone is it'll actually alarm you mm-hmm. when shooting light comes over the the apple phone it won't do that with oh really so yeah but eh. but it is it, it's a great app we use it a ton and it's got a great duck identification section on it as well and you can look at regs so if you're maybe yep. hunting utah for the first time you can pull those regs right up on that ducks unlimited app so man Get that app, download it, use it, support the local club, support the national office. You know, you, there's a lot you can do to help improve the habitat in the state of Nevada. Yeah, no, I, I can't say enough. I can't say, like, enough about Jason and helping us out and, you know, doing everything else for ducks and that app. Like, I will tell you 110% that is why I bought my DU membership this year is so I had access to the app. Yeah, the app is absolutely wonderful. You can load pictures. You can load your daily ducks. You can load your locations. It documents the wind speed. It documents the weather. Mm-hmm. It documents how long you hunted. It documents your group. So, like, I'm a big data guy, and I love the data that I'm able to go back and pull up in that app. Well, it's cool. You can log that, and then also you can report how your day is if they're mostly, you know, neighbor ducks, um, if they're locals, if the fly is – if all of a sudden you're seeing a bunch of different ducks that you hadn't seen before, you can actually report that to in the app. And then other people can see, um, you know, so if you're hunting Overton, you can see what someone else hunted there last weekend at blind 26 and saw a significant number of, say, gadwall for this, in this case. Yeah. Um, the reports are, are, I use the reports all the time to see, to try to ch- identify when um, the actual migration is happening. And what kind of decoys is set up and things of that nature. Yeah. Well, and that's the cool thing about the, that migration map is awesome because you can, it may not give you a lot of times we don't get the Overton stuff in there, right? So, yes. but you can get you can hit Cedar City or Salt Lake or the California Flyway, some of the same areas, and you can kind of see from north to south mm-hmm. where the ducks have moved. And so, if they're moving through Salt Lake, well, they're not quite here yet, yeah. right? So it's going you know you're going to lag behind. But if they've moved through Salt Lake and they're moving out, now you know the ducks are probably moving they're coming down in your direction, and. Yeah. And it's pretty cool because you can, guys are reporting, you know, there's a lot of guys that are reporting almost every day on that saying, hey, yeah, no change or the mm-hmm. ducks were spotty or, or whatever. So it, it's a great tool. The, the whole app is just a wonderful tool for a duck hunter. So I think we're good. I think we're good. Well, as always, if you're going to go out this weekend, make sure you take somebody with you if you can. If you're going to take somebody with you, make sure you teach them something. If you can't do either of those two things, as always, hunt hard. Thanks. I sure appreciate you guys. Thank you very much. You're welcome.